I know what's out there. I've known for a while. Some people will tell you that they're just like us. They'll humanize them, put them on our level. Those people are wrong. The creatures out there aren't human, no matter how much they look like us. Some of them used to be, but they gave that up a long time ago. And there's no going back. They're nothing more than animals now. Snarling, vicious things that can never truly be trusted, even if they smile and tell you that they're domesticated. They'll feed on you the second it's convenient for them. Mark my words. I've seen their work for most of my life. Vampires, sirens, werewolves, fae, monsters, the lot of them. So-called apex predators, feasting on us just because they can. Well, I'm not inclined to take it. That's why I joined the Brotherhood. A lot of the folks in the Brethren Knights of St. Fontaine were born into it. Not me. I earned my place amongst their ranks. It started off a few years back when I took down some vampire they'd been tracking. Roberto. I'd been working solo for a few years by that point, and I stumbled on him by chance. I was using this girl as bait, pretty little thing named Michelle. She brought the creeps in, and I dealt with them. I'll admit, I've always let my anger get the better of me when dealing with their kind. Maybe it would just be easier to put a bullet in their head and be done with it. But no, they deserve so much worse. I've seen firsthand the suffering caused by the death they leave in their wake. I've seen the misery they sow in the lives of each and every single one of their victims. See, when you kill someone, you aren't just ending their life. No, you're ending the lives of everyone who loved them. You're tearing this hole in their hearts that'll never be filled again. I've seen it more times than I can count. I've seen what it does to people. And these sons of bitches just walk around for centuries, destroying life after life. They do it because they can. Hell, some of them probably do it because it's fun. So yeah, I think a bullet to the head is too good for most of them. It's necessary for some, but for others, well, I make sure they get what's coming to them. Back then, my favorite method was to pull out the teeth. It was a faster process for vampires than it was for sirens. Less teeth to pull out, but it still hurt. Naturally, when I got my hands on Roberto, that's exactly what I did to him. Michelle brought him in from the bar to the hotel room we'd rented, where I was waiting for him. I took out his knees while she distracted him. I had a pistol with a silencer. One shot to the back of each leg to drop him, then I got my pliers and I set to work. He fought. They all fought. But it didn't matter. Michelle wouldn't usually stick around, didn't have the stomach for it. She'd just leave and I'd pay her the next morning, after I was done with the bloodsucker. I had all sorts of nasty little methods for dealing with him. With Roberto, I just went to town on him with my fist. Feels good to do it that way sometimes. He was one of those pretentious, prissy vampires. One of the ones who thought he was all that, you know? I tied him down, and I showed him that he wasn't. I just went to town. His nose broke first, then his jaw. He was snappy with me for the first couple of hits, but after about 20 minutes, he was begging for me to let him go. After 40 minutes, he was crying. After an hour, he was dead. It was just another night for me at the time. I dumped that asshole into the bathtub and I left him for housekeeping to deal with. I never expected it to catch up to me, and I sure as hell didn't expect it to lead where it did. It was about three weeks later that the Brotherhood found me. I'd been at a burger joint grabbing some lunch, minding my own damn business, when I noticed a group of guys walk in. They didn't look like locals. 
I was living in a small town in Arizona at the time, and nobody walked around dressed like that. They all wore tailored black suits as if they were coming from some fancy business meeting. There were three of them. Two of them kept their distance. They sat at a nearby booth and just watched. The last one walked right up to me. Looking at him, he was obviously the guy in charge. He was somewhere in his 60s and bald, but he carried himself with this importance that was kind of hard not to admire. Without asking, he pulled out a chair across from me and sat down, folding his hands neatly in front of him. I just stared at him the whole time, and I knew some of the other folks in the restaurant were giving him some odd glances too, but he didn't so much as bother looking in any other direction but mine. Uh, am I in some kind of trouble? I asked, setting down my lunch. That depends. Have you any sins to confess? The old man replied. Now, that got a laugh out of me. I leaned back in my chair, sizing the old man up again, as I tried to figure out if he was for real or not. <laughs> you some kind of priest or something? I ain't looking to get saved, mister. Something like that, he began. Although, if you wanted salvation, there are other men who could grant you that. It's Lucas, right? Lucas Van Coverden. Quite an exquisite name. Uh, it's just Lucas, if you don't mind. The rest of it is a bit much, I replied. The old man smiled. Lucas, he said. A good name all the same. A strong name. You can call me Roy. Roy Bergman. It's a pleasure to meet you. He offered a hand to shake. I didn't shake it. So what can I do for you, Mr. Bergman? I asked. I'm going to assume you ain't here because I've got a pretty name. Of course not, Roy assured me. Of course not. I'm here because my friends and I are fans of your work. I raised an eyebrow and started listening a little closer. One of your recent, um, customers, Roberto. He was a man we were interested in for quite some time. Your, um, methods may be cruder than some of us might like, but you are effective. The good work you've done has made that very clear. Roberto, I repeated. It took a few moments to remember just who that was. So you like that, huh? You're familiar with some of my other projects. VR, Roy said. And I, for one, am impressed. Talent like yours is not present in everyone. Many don't have the stomach for it, but for those that do, there are doors that are open for them. Places where they can find others like them. That's so, I asked. Indeed, this calling of ours, it's a dangerous one. Doing it alone usually only ends one way. But as part of a brotherhood of like-minded men, sharing the same common goals... You trying to recruit me? I interrupted, cracking a small smile. Ah, only if you're interested... But I suspect that we share a goal. Perhaps you'd like to discuss it in private. See if I'm right. What did I have to lose, I thought. I picked up my burger again and took a bite, before glancing at Roy's buddies sitting a few tables away. A security detail. For both of us, he said. We both have enemies. Experience has taught me it's better to come prepared. Ah, I'll bet, I said, polishing off the last of my burger. Hey, um, you got a place we can talk shop then? Roy looked back at me. 
a small grin tugging at the corners of his lips. Why don't we go for a ride? I'll tell you everything. I told him to lead the way. As we left the burger place, Roy led me towards a black SUV parked out front. His buddies got in the front seats. Roy and I sat in the back. So? I asked. Tell me about this little club of yours, and I'll tell you if I'm game or not. They're an old organization, Roy replied. We've christened ourselves as the Brethren Knights of St. Fontaine. Okay, so what? You some sort of religious group then? Uh, yes and no. You could call us a splinter group. The original Brotherhood was born in the years after the fall of the Knights Templar. See, even while their brothers burned for crimes they'd never committed, some of the remaining Knights refused to give up their holy missions. So they renounced the church, went underground, took on a new name, and continued their holy mission. Or so I'm told anyways. Not a lot of records left of how it all started. But what I know for sure is that they all did God's work. They became increasingly aware of the devil's children roaming this world. And so... They pledged themselves towards their eradication. That is how it has been since our order began. While many of our current members are still quite steadfast in their faith, it isn't a requirement. It used to be that membership was passed from father to son. But that isn't the way to keep the Brotherhood alive. Never was, and we know it. We're in need of new recruits who know what they're doing and have the drive to do what is necessary. While once upon a time, faith might have been a foundation of the Brotherhood, today it's less about God and more about man. Our mission is simple, to guarantee the survival and supremacy of mankind against those who would seek to destroy us. It's a dramatic way of saying, we kill those who would kill us. Suppose I can get behind the simplicity of that, I said. Most can. Vampires don't care about God, and it doesn't require a holy man to kill one. Only a man willing to do what is necessary. Okay, so how do I get in? I asked. You want me to fill out a form or something? Roy just laughed. Membership isn't so simple, but I thought you might be interested. I spoke with one of our leaders, Brother Gallen, about sponsoring you. Usually, what that means is that you would be given a trial of sorts. A mission during which you'll be given the opportunity to prove your worth and your devotion to the cause. Shit, is that all? I asked. Sounds like a cakewalk to me, man. You got a target in mind? As a matter of fact, I do, Roy said. Two, in fact. Some of the most high profile we've ever gone after I won't lie to you. These are ambitious targets. Maybe too ambitious for a trial. But you're a little more experienced than your average recruit. I thought you might appreciate the challenge. A lot of vampires seem to think of them like monarchs. Queens. They've certainly earned the title. Our intel suggests they've been organizing the vampires on the West Coast for a few decades now, helping them survive and thrive, kill them, and we may just destabilize them, set them back, and send them running into the shadows. 
He took a folder from a pouch behind the driver's seat and offered it to me. Help us pull this off. And not only are you a part of the Brotherhood, you can send the undead a message that their time is over. I opened the folder and was greeted by photographs of two women. Both of them were blonde, with olive skin and green eyes. They were clearly sisters, maybe even twins, although it was clear to tell who was who. Mia and Leah Darling, I murmured, reading over the attached files. They don't look like much. Well, Intel says otherwise, he began. Some of the creatures we've interrogated have claimed they're baptized, blessed by Satan himself with some infernal power. We'll see how much that's worth. What's that supposed to mean? I asked. Infernal power? Allegedly, they're harder to kill, he began. You and I have killed more than our fair share of vampires. We both know that they all go down the same. If you're in, then you can pack your things tonight and meet me at the airport tomorrow. We've saved you a seat on a flight to Los Angeles. Did you now? Well, that was awful sweet of you, I said, half joking, as I handed the file back to Roy. Well, I guess I'll be seeing you tomorrow then. I could tell that my new buddy was awfully glad to hear that. I could see a warm smile creep across his face. Well then, I'm looking forward to working with you, Lucas, he said, before offering me a hand to shake. I'll be seeing you tomorrow. Now I've done a fair bit of traveling for my own hunting purposes, but I'd never been all the way out to Los Angeles before. I'd always imagined it would be some prissy, cosmopolitan shithole. And you know what? I was completely right. I really can't say I've got a lot of kind things to say about LA, other than it was probably a vampire's paradise. Active nightlife, plenty of shitty neighborhoods where I can't imagine anybody looks too hard at the dead bodies. Yeah... I could easily see why a couple of so-called vampire queens would have set up shop there. The hotel we got was in the nicer part of town at least. I got my own room and brought some of my nicer clothes to join Roy and his two buddies for lunch after we got settled in. On the flight in, he'd introduce them as Brian Adams and Sean Reach, although I hadn't spoken much to either of them. They mostly just seemed to follow Roy. He was obviously the man running the show. Now our best bet is to catch them separately, Roy had said over lunch. We've got another brother in town who's been keeping tabs on them. You'll meet him later. According to him, Leah Darling rarely leaves their penthouse. She has visitors in and out during the day, but she only leaves to attend the odd social event. Parties, nightclubs. He suspects she often hunts there as there have been a few suspicious deaths. However, he also thinks that she has a stable supply of blood inside her home. Spooking her could cause her to seal herself inside, and who knows how long she can wait us out. We can't get in? I asked. Set up some sort of business meeting? They're looking into it. But Leah appears to be choosy on who she'll meet with, he replied. I scoffed. Of course she was. Well, what about the other one? I asked. Mia. She'll likely be an easier target. She comes and goes as she pleases, but has a fairly predictable routine. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening, She's at the gym, and on Saturday and Sunday nights, she tends to visit various nightclubs. She usually brings her prey back home, but we haven't seen her kill any of them yet. Aw, ain't that sweet. A vampire with a conscience, I teased. If she's the easier target, could we capture her? Use her to lure out the other one? 
Perhaps, assuming she'd take the bait, Roy noted. But keeping her captive might prove an issue. We're going to kill her anyway, I said with a shrug. The hell doesn't matter if we do it before or after we've got the other one. I could see Roy thinking it over. I suppose not. Our sources indicate the sisters are close. We might succeed in emotionally compromising the other one if she thinks we have her sister. She may not think rationally. All the more reason to do it, I said. And we know she'll be there tomorrow, don't we? At the gym. You said she's got a routine. Roy chuckled and leaned back in his seat. He looked over at Brian beside him, grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> Listen to this. I love this boy. Already eager to get the job done. His attention returned to me. Tomorrow night then, he said. Let's see what you've got, killer. I wasn't looking to let the old man down. The gym Mia Darling frequented was a more upscale place. The kind of gym where you might find the odd celebrity slumming it. That didn't really surprise me. Their file had indicated that the twins had good money, and the name Darling sounded familiar. I'd heard it tossed around in the same sentences as other luxury fashion brands some folks gave a shit about. Personally, I never saw the appeal of that kind of thing. And truth be told, I kind of like the idea of putting one of those high and mighty fashion mogul types in their place. Mia Darling. Sure as hell look the part of a fashion mogul too. Blonde hair, green eyes, olive skin and stunningly beautiful. She was almost statuesque in a way, and according to the pictures, her sister looked just about the same. That said, Mia was a little beefier than her sister, with broader shoulders and a more muscular physique. Comparing her to Leah, who judging by the pictures was a scrawny little thing that looked like she could be blown over by a gust of wind, well, Mia was the one I'd have been more afraid of. She was doing body weights in one of the rooms when we got there. Push-ups, planks, burpees, shit like that. I dressed for the occasion, as had my escort. Brian and Sean had been sent along with me. Roy didn't fit in quite as well at the gym scene, and had instead opted to watch the door. Out of the lot of us, I'd say that Brian probably blended in best. He looked more at home in workout clothes and a baseball cap than he did in a suit. We picked some machines across from the room where Mia was doing her workout so we could watch her and chat quietly amongst ourselves. So, how are we going to lure her out? Sean asked. Lot of witnesses. We can try and get her out when she leaves, Brian said. We got Roy outside. He could slash her tires, use that to isolate her. No, no, she'd call for help. I interrupted. We need to be more creative. I scanned the room, looking for some ideas. It didn't take me long to find one. You two up for some body weights? Can you lock her in? I asked. Sure. You got a plan, though? Brian asked. Kinda. I know how to get her alone. With that, I got up and headed toward the hallway with the locker rooms. Looking back, I saw Brian and Sean heading for the room Mia was in. Good to know they were willing to trust me. I wasted no time in heading into the men's locker room. Nobody else was there, just me. I found the fire alarm pretty quickly. It seemed like the easiest way to get rid of the witnesses. We could deal with a darling girl and slip her body out through the back before anybody realized what we were doing. I pulled the handle. The alarm blared. It was worth a die on my hands. I could already see it in my head. A bunch of gym rats looking up in concern and confusion before leaving. I knew Mia would try and do the same, and she'd run right into Brian and Sean. Best not to keep them waiting. 
A lot of the people were already at the door when I made it back onto the gym floor. None of them paid us any mind. Soon enough, we'd be well enough alone. Brian and Sean stood dutifully by the door to the room Mia was in. I could see a gun in each of their hands, and I pulled my own forty-five from my sweatpants before joining them. Sorry about the chaos, I said as I walked in past Brian and Sean. I had to make sure we weren't disturbed, though. Mia just cocked her head slightly. She didn't look the slightest bit intimidated. If anything, she just looked annoyed. Hell of a way to introduce yourself, she said. So, you gonna tell me what this is about, or are you gonna just shoot me? I cracked a small smile. Not much fun in just shooting you, is there? I asked. From the corner of my eye, I noticed Roy coming in through the front door. He approached us slowly, walking in behind me. Mia, darling, he said softly. I've heard a lot about you. And yet I've heard nothing of you, she replied. I'm being very patient right now. But my patience is running thin. What do you want? Oh, that's quite simple, Roy assured her. I want what you're trying to take from us. Supremacy. I must admit, I never thought anyone would ever be able to organize those creatures. But you and your sister have done an admirable job. Ah, so that's what this is about, Mia said wistfully. If you're concerned about vampires, then you and I really shouldn't be enemies. We want the exact same things as you do. Order. Peace. Safety. Ugh. There is no safety with your kind in this world, Roy replied. All of us have seen that much firsthand. Well, it's a difficult job, ruling over subjects who often view themselves as above law and morality. But someone needs to take control, she said. I disagree, Roy said. See, I think that what we need is a world free of you, your kind, your hunger, your corruption. So many innocent human lives lost because of what you and your kind do. And yet here you are, telling me that you're looking to make it better. Empires aren't built overnight. You may not remember the way things used to be. But I do, Mia said. Trust me, without us, it would be worse, she said. Roy just shrugged. Agree to disagree then, he said, before waving his hand. You know what to do. I was the first one to pull the trigger. The bullet struck Mia straight in the head, tearing away a chunk of her skull. Roy stepped back, letting Sean, Brian, and I open fire on her. I unloaded three rounds into her body. I don't know how many times Sean and Brian shot her, but she took a few steps back from the impact as blood spattered against the gym mirrors behind her. I expected her to fall, to collapse like a puppet with her strings cut. But Mia Darling continued to stand. Well, I suppose that's one way to end a discussion, she said. Her head moved, her remaining eye fixated on me. I watched as the blood that should have spilled down her face instead seemed to float outwards droplets suspended in the air before they began to flow backward into her head. I watched as Mia's wounds healed, as if they hadn't even been there in the first place. Her body seemed to reconstruct itself, 
The chunk torn out of her skull seemed to mend itself back together, and the wounds on her body closed up as if they'd never even been there. But I don't die like the others of my kind you've likely killed. You'll need to do better. I swore under my breath, and I raised the gun to fire again. But Mia moved so much faster. With blinding speed, she crossed the room. Sean went first. He fired, but she grabbed him by the wrist, twisting his arm and sending him down to the ground with a heavy thud. Brian went next. Just like before, she lunged for him with blinding speed and grabbed him by the shirt. Before hurling him towards the mirrors she'd been standing in front of a moment ago. I was the last to go down. Before I could react, Mia was just a breath away from me. I tried to move my gun, but I couldn't keep up with her. I felt her elbow me in the stomach before she lifted me off the ground and hurled me back down. When the world stopped spinning, I saw her standing in front of Roy. I almost expected her to hit him too, but no. She just looked him in the eye and spoke in a cold, calm voice. You should consider yourself fortunate. I'm much more forgiving than my sister is. This time you'll walk away. But provoke us again. Well, I won't be able to stay my sister's hand a second time. Roy just stared at her calm and unflinching. Then, he quietly stepped aside and let Mia pass. She walked out without even looking back at us. What the hell was that? I heard Sean say. He picked himself up and was tending to Brian. Roy just watched as Mia walked out the front door. He thought for a moment before answering. That was a warning. Slowly, I picked myself up. I grabbed my gun and for a moment considered running out and taking another shot at Mia. But I had a feeling that wouldn't go well for me. So, what's plan B? I asked. Drastic measures, Roy said. They obviously can't be killed like an ordinary vampire, Roy said, as we ate a quiet dinner alone in my hotel room. Sean and Brian had already turned in for the night. It was just the two of us. They'll need something more severe, he began. Something they can't heal from. Holy weapons would be ideal. But our organization hasn't possessed those for a number of years now. I don't suppose you'd know where to get some? I asked. Afraid not. We used to have a selection of daggers we could use in situations like these. But the last one we had was destroyed a few years back, attempting to kill one of the devil's more prominent avatars. Uh, so that ain't gonna work. I sighed, and I racked my brain trying to think up something new. Hey, what about fire? You know, like an explosion of some sort. Bomb the shit out of them. Perhaps we could acquire something, but we need an opportunity. Perhaps during one of their nightclub visits, assuming we can catch them during one, he said. Bomb them at a nightclub? I asked. Ain't that kind of risky? A lot of people in the crossfire. The lives of a few drunk partygoers aren't much of consequence when you weigh them against what we hope to kill, Roy replied. I would argue that this is an acceptable sacrifice, don't you? I thought we were doing this to save people, though. We're going to kill a lot more, I said. It's a hard choice, Roy agreed. Look me in the eyes, Lucas. We both know that this is a hard choice. I did. 
I looked him in the eye, but I'm not so sure about what I saw. Uh, our mission, ad hominem, is for humanity, he began. That's what it means. Throughout history, great men have made sacrifices for the sake of the greater good. You saw what I saw. That vampire, you saw what she's capable of. They're using those people as a shield. They're counting on us being too weak to exploit it. It's our duty to prove them wrong. Do you understand that? Because if we don't, those people are dead anyways. They'll kill more than them in just a few years. It's a matter of numbers, simple as that. I caught myself frowning a little. But I supposed he had a point. We could either deal with the collateral or risk missing our chance. I wasn't exactly thrilled by the prospect of collateral damage, but how else would we get a shot at them? Even bombing their penthouse wasn't a sure deal and would be even riskier. This was the better option. They're moderately public figures, right? I asked. Might be an event coming up where Leah would be expected to show. I can't imagine the other one would be far away if she did. We can look, Roy replied. See what we can find. In the meanwhile, I've got some connections. We can get someone to set something up for us. So long as we get the opportunity. With that, Roy got up. We'll deal with it tomorrow. For now, I'm tired. He headed for the door, before pausing and looking back at me. Oh, and Lucas, despite today's failure, you did well. Be proud of yourself for that much. I nodded at him. Well, thank you kindly, sir. I raised a beer to him, and then he was gone. The next few days passed quietly. I let Roy do what he needed to do. Me, Brian, and Sean focused on smaller jobs to keep ourselves busy, helping some of the local brotherhood deal with little threats here and there. Nothing special, but it was fun. I guess. It was after one of those little hunts when I got back to my room that I found Roy waiting for me. Having fun? He asked half-jokingly. Having a blast, I replied. You look like you got something to say, so you might as well say it. <laughs> I'll keep it brief, he assured me. There's a party at the Ivory Nightclub in two days' time. You're going to be there. I paused as I went to fix myself a drink from the minibar. The darlings? I asked. He nodded. I've arranged for a package to be delivered to us tomorrow. Find a good place for it. Somewhere close to the twins, where it won't attract attention. Then... A cold smile crossed Roy's face. Well, sounds easy enough, I said. I like your attitude, boy. If this goes off, you'll have officially earned your place among our ranks. Exciting, isn't it? He was right it was. The night of the party wouldn't come soon enough. Roy and I went alone, driving in an SUV. He held a briefcase with him, one I'd never seen before. He didn't need to tell me what was in it. I could figure that much out myself. He never got out of the car when we parked in front of the nightclub. He just wordlessly handed the briefcase to me and offered me a warm, almost gentle smile. Make us proud, Lucas. I nodded at him. I had no intention of failing. I walked into that nightclub as if I owned the place, scanning the crowd for the twins. Didn't take me long to find them. Leah and Mia Darling sat together at a booth near the back. Neither of them appeared to notice me. Looking around, I spotted another empty booth beside them. The perfect hiding spot. In and out. 
It was going to be so damn simple. I moved through the crowd towards the empty booth. I didn't bother him too much. Maybe I was just being soft, but I didn't want to look at them. I didn't want to see their faces. A lot of these folks were about to die, and none of them were going to understand why. But it was just as Roy said, you know, matter of numbers. I made it to the booth and sat down, setting the briefcase under it and kicking it back out of sight. I exhaled a breath before looking out at the party. In and out, I could do this. You know, the funny thing is, I don't think a single person really paid me much mind as I got up to leave the club. When I reached the door and looked back, the only ones who seemed to be looking at me were the darling twins still seated at their booth. I could see a look of resignation on Mia's face, with maybe a little bit of frustration. Leah, on the other hand, her fingers were steepled as she sat back in the booth, her legs casually crossed. I couldn't figure out what the look on her face meant. Not at the time, anyways. Looking back now, I realized that she was laughing at me. We were a few blocks away when the bomb went off. I heard the rest of it on the news. Twelve dead. A lot less than I'd expected, actually. I was a little relieved by that. I'm no explosives expert, but looking at the video of the scene I saw in the days that followed, the bomb should have killed more people. Not that I'm complaining. The less needless blood on my hands, the better, right? Of those twelve, I was hoping the two of them were the twins. They must have been right there when the blast went off. But I never heard anything for sure. Roy had me knighted as a member of the Brotherhood the day after the bomb went off. I figured that was probably the end of it. I should have known better. It was three days after we killed the darling twins, and it was meant to be my last day in L.A. I'd booked my flight home and was minding my own damn business at the hotel bar. I hadn't seen Roy that day. Or Brian, or Sean, but that was fine. They had their own shit to settle. I didn't notice her coming in. She moved without making a sound, and it wasn't until she spoke from the seat beside me that I realized she was even there. I warned you, you know. I almost jumped at the sound of her voice as I looked over at her. Mia Darling didn't have a damn scratch on her. Her skin was perfect. She was dressed in a clean white button-down shirt with the cuffs undone. She watched me from the corner of her eye, almost looking jaded. I told you, she's not as forgiving as I am. But you didn't listen, did you? What the hell? No, no, no. You're dead? Mia interrupted. Sorry to disappoint you, but I don't die like other vampires. She finally turned her head to look at me. Let's go for a ride, Lucas. She wants to show you something. With that, Mia stood up and gestured for me to follow. I thought about going for my gun, putting a bullet in the back of her head, but I already knew that wasn't going to work. So I did the only thing I could. I got up and I followed. Mia's car was waiting outside. She drove in silence, refusing to respond to me, even when I tried to talk to her. Not that I tried much. Truth be told, I was waiting for her to kill me. But she just kept driving out towards the edge of the city, then north along the coast. We drove for the better part of an hour before she stopped in the middle of the highway. She put the car in park before turning to look at me. So this is where you're going to do it, huh? I asked. Do what? Kill you? She asked. No, no, not me at least. Depending on how you speak to Leah, though, well, we'll see. For what it's worth, I did put in a word for you. 
Consider it the last kindness I'll grant you. If you choose to waste it, Mia shrugged nonchalantly. Well, then I've done all I can to spare your life, and you're the one who threw it away. Not me. How generous of you, I murmured. You're welcome. Goodbye, Lucas. I hope this is the last time we see each other. I didn't respond as I got out of the car and looked around. It didn't take me long to spot it. What she'd brought me to see. They were lined up on the beach. About fifteen of them, give or take. Crucifixes. Each one carrying the body of a man. And beneath them stood Leah Darling, her hands behind her back as she waited for me. Slowly, I approached her. Ah, the new recruit, she crooned. So you finally come to join your new brothers. But it seems my sister has ensured I've no place to put you. A shame. What? What did you do? I asked, my voice cracking as I looked up at the crucified men. In the golden light of the setting sun, I recognized Roy, stripped naked and lashed to one of the crosses near the middle. Next to him, I saw Brian and Sean. I saw other men I recognized, other members of the Brotherhood. The very ones who'd inaugurated me just a few days before. Were it up to me, I would have hunted your organization down to the last man and strung them up here, she said. But my sister believes in diplomacy. So here we are. Welcome to my diplomatic solution. She extended her arms. In the glow of the setting sun, she looked almost like a goddess, ready to unleash her wrath. Witness my generosity firsthand and share it with your brotherhood. Mercy is a gift I only ever grant once. Next time... This ocean will run red for generations with the blood of your brothers. That I promise you. I remained frozen to the spot, staring at her. I looked at the corpses of Roy and the others, still unable to believe they were dead. But I could see them. They were way past my help. She hadn't brought me here to save them. She'd brought me here to taunt me. Looking into this woman's eyes, I knew that what she was saying was more than just a bunch of empty threats. These were promises she meant to keep. Leah approached me, drawing close enough that I could smell her perfume. Do you understand? She asked, her voice low and cold. I couldn't speak. All I could do was weakly nod. Good. Then this is farewell. Make sure it's permanent. She brushed past me, heading to Mia's car and leaving me alone before the row of crosses. When I looked back, the twins were long gone. And soon so was I. I've done all I can to further the Brotherhood's mission in the years since I encountered the Darling Twins. My belief in what we stand for hasn't wavered. I can't rightly say I'm proud of everything we've done. Some of it ain't much to be proud of. But it is necessary. Everything I've done has been absolutely necessary. I've seen firsthand what we're up against. I've seen the horrible depths of their brutality up close. And I hate them all the more for it. One of these days, 
I'll come back for those twins. One of these days, I'll kill them. But it ain't gonna be anytime soon. Not until I know for sure I can do it. Not until I know I can win. Until then, I've made sure we've heeded their warning.